Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Cynthia Holt. I am the Executive Director for the Council of Atlantic Academic Libraries. Uh, we welcome you this morning to our webinar, Internet Archive Canada, Preserving and Expanding Access to Digital Collections. Uh, once again, this is hosted uh, by the uh, Digital Preservation and Stewardship Committee for CALL. Um, I am going to do a few housekeeping things and then I'm going to turn the session over to our moderator, uh, Evan Eccles, who is the digital, this I always have to get your thing right, the digital collections uh, archivist for the University of New Brunswick. <laughs> <laughs> uh, everybody's cha titles change every once in a while, so I always have to make sure I'm using the correct one. Um, so uh, just for the sake of uh, a good uh, a, a good experience for everybody, we ask that you keep yourself muted during the session unless you're asking a question. And also, uh, if you could turn your video off, if you're not, you can turn it back on when you're speaking, but if you can turn it off when you're not, just because some of our, our folks are coming in from low bandwidth areas, so we want to optimize their experience as well. Uh, the recording for this session, so the session is being recorded. We will, I will post it to the call website and also the YouTube channel uh, shortly after the session is over. Um, so that, and I will send a message out to everybody who registered for the webinar uh, telling you when it's available on the call website and the YouTube channel. Um, so I'd, I'd like to start by an acknowledgement uh, that call CVPA members sit on the unceded and traditional territories of the Mi'kmaq, Beatuk, uh, Inu, and Inuit, uh, Wol Wolostoic, and Peskatamukudi. I want to make sure I did that right. This is our new acknowledgement, but I want to make sure we're actually uh, properly uh, pronouncing the the original names and the names that those those cultures uh, and nations wish to uh, wish us to use. Uh, Treaties of Peace and Friendship were first signed in 1725 between the British Crown and the Mi'kmaq and Wolostoic peoples. The treaties did not deal with the surrender of lands and resources, but recognized Mi'kmaq and Wolostoic title and established the rules for what was to be an ongoing relationship between the nations. Uh, we acknowledge with respect the diverse histories and cultures of the First Peoples of this region, and we express our gratitude as guests on this land. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Evan Eccles uh, from the University of New Brunswick, and he will introduce our speakers. Evan. Uh, thanks, Cynthia, and thanks for everyone for attending our webinar on the current projects of the of uh, Internet Archive Canada. And today we have two speakers. First, um, Andrea Mills, the Executive Director of Internet Archive Canada, and for um over 16 years uh she's she's been with the with with the organization and andrea has become um really really immersed in all facets of managing digitization pro projects at at academic libraries archives and government institutions andrea is responsible for uh coordinating internet archive efforts in canada with a focus on building a Canadian digital library by and for Canadians. Second, we have Lauren Fantin, the Special Projects and Strategic Initiatives Lead at Internet Archives Canada, and uh, she's uh, co-leading the Democracy Democracies Library Canada um, initiatives. And a librarian and archivist, Lauren, joined uh, Internet Archives Canada in the fall of 2022 after years of leading Our Digital World, a nonprofit where she worked on many projects involving both grassroots and larger organizations on the first province wide collaborative initiative to provide integrated access to GLAM digital collections, newspapers, and government documents. And uh, we're going to have time, time at the end of the session for questions, but in the meantime, feel free to drop any questions you have in the chat and we'll take them up at the end of the session. And with that, uh, Andrea, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you so much. And uh, good morning, everyone. 
Um, I just wanted to say, um, take a moment to say, I had a we had a lovely time in Halifax this past summer, and I think maybe we we met several of you on the call um, for the ABC Copyright Conference. So it's it's lovely to beam back into Eastern Canada and to talk to all of you this morning. Um, and I would also like to take um, a moment and some time for um, acknowledging uh, the land where Internet Archive meets and works on a daily basis. So we work on the traditional territory of many nations um, uh, in the places where we work, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wandat peoples. It's now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis. And we acknowledge that uh, Toronto, where I am today, is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. At our site in Edmonton, we gather on Treaty 6 territory. And in Vancouver, where our headquarters is based, we're on the unceded, unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples. And we're indebted to all of the generations of Indigenous caretakers that have allowed us to work, live, and call this land home. And I, I very much appreciate uh, um, the um, land acknowledgement um, uh, today and uh, making space for that. So thank you. So why are we here today? My name is Andrea Mills, as Evan said, and I am the Executive Director of Internet Archive Canada. And um, I have been working in um, sort of all parts of Internet Archive as it's grown and uh, developed across Canada over, over these years. So I'm going to give a little bit of hits and history on Internet Archive and Internet Archive Canada. And then I'm going to pass it on to Lorraine to um, uh, give us um, details of our services and um, our initiatives and sort of how we're working with uh, um, organizations across Canada. And that's what I just said. I forgot to move my slide. Uh, so hopefully this will be a, a good, um, hopefully everyone will learn something about the Internet Archive today. If you didn't know um, anything, you learned something. And if you were familiar with our work, you know, hopefully there's some new, new details that you can take away from, with you. So as I said, uh, Internet Archive, um, it is a nonprofit digital library. Um, of, you know, we're very well known for internet sites, but um, we have lots of other cultural artifacts in digital form and things that have been digitized. And like a paper library, we provide free access to researchers, historians, scholars, and people with perceptual disabilities, which is um, projects that are uh, close to my heart professionally, and of course, to the general public. Um, and we're really excited to see so many people here this morning and interested in, in our work. Um, the mission statement that we've been working under since Internet Archive was created is a goal of universal access to all knowledge. Um, and the, this is the Internet Archive headquarters in San Francisco. And yes, it actually does look like the, the logo. Um, it was founded in 1996. And if you sort of sit and think about 1996, those of us that were around at that time, lots of things have changed since then. Um, and that was when the, the nascent years of, of the internet. And of course, lots has changed about the internet and the web since then, but it really continues to be the mode of access for not just information, but cultural heritage and um, sort of that promise of universal access continues through those that have access to the internet, which I acknowledge is not not everyone, but um, it is you know continuing to be the mode um, that will afford this. So some big numbers. Um, when we started, when I started in 2006, we would have a party when we had a thousand things in our uh, books collection, but things have grown quite a bit since then. Um, so. We can see the numbers here, lots of web pages, um, lots of books and texts that ha have been digitized either by us or by partner organizations or uploaded um, or digital um, material uploaded, um, audio recordings, video. We are archiving television news um, and then a, a really growing um, images collection. So we have um, a, a very large NASA collection uh, of images and, and other um, Museums and heritage organizations are depositing their images with us. And uh, the software program, uh, which has a lot of um, emulated um, historical software programs that you can use. Drilling down a bit onto digitization, which is you know, my, my background within our wider org, um, we have digitization staff 
all over the world now. We, we started here at University of Toronto, I'm proud to say, um, but it's now expanded. And we have um, folks working on our books engineering all over the world. Um, I'm jealous of those that live in uh, New Zealand. Uh, meetings are hard to schedule, um, but we have more than 100 people working every day to digitize a, at the moment about 25,000 books a week. Um, and that's sort of clocked in now to there is more than 10 million books that have been digitized, but there's also 5 million periodical issues. And um, we have actually just clicked over and um, Loren will talk a little bit more about this. 900,000 of those um, have been digitized here in Canada. So a brief overview of some of our services that we, we may not drill into deeply today, but just an overview of, of what, what is provided. We have an interlibrary loan service that is um, uh, you know, part of a lot of the places where academic libraries um, do ILL, like Rapid and WorldShare. And we're, we're serving about 500 requests a day. Um, and we try to do that within an hour or so. Um, so we have folks working on that all over the place, different time zones. Um, the Archive It web archiving service, which many of you may be um, familiar with, um, it's now about 1,300 GLAM organizations in 40 countries that are using archive and services. Digitization we'll talk more about. Um, open library is that um, uh, collective um, uh, library catalog, um, uh, catalog of catalogs. Um, it has about 7.5 million users, and that is a way to discover not only books that have been digitized by the Internet Archive, but ones that we have not yet. Um, we have the, as I mentioned, the software archive, the television news, and uh, there's a political ad um, uh, special archive, which maybe we don't want to talk about that right now. Um, <laughs> and you can also see some other projects that we're working on that are sort of burgeoning and new um, on our website at the archive.org slash projects. Um, and then just a moment to revisit, you know, the thing that is the, we are most known for that I, if, if someone doesn't know what the Internet Archive is, I ask them if they know what the Wayback Machine is, and usually the answer is yes. Um, and that archive has now reached um, 900 billion web pages dating back to 1996. And there is um, a search function that isn't a full text search, but there's some targeted searching that you can do on that collection, which is um, um, an interesting uh, but really valuable improvement for research. Um, and then, uh, you know, as I mentioned, we have this global project that is, you know, quite large and has, has spread across the world. And now we're going to drill down a little bit into Canada. So the Internet Archive has really spent the last few years, I would say, you know, since, you know, 2020, um, really focused on infrastructure and technology in Canada, um, making sure that we have um, our own, if you will. Um, at Internet Archive Canada, um, and also sort of building our community of um, supporters and colleagues that are working in this space. So we've really been partnering with Canadian institutions all the way back to 2004, which is when we started our pilot project here at U of T. Um, but we've really been reaching beyond just libraries and archives into the digital community, making new partnerships, and particularly in Western Canada. Um, and so just a few things you didn't know about Internet Archive Canada. So it, it is actually a separate not-for-profit library. So Internet Archive Canada was incorporated in 2006. And at the moment, we have regional digitization centers and sort of, you know, brick and mortar uh, spaces here at University of Toronto, University of Alberta. Um, and in the last few years, we have um, scribes, as we call our digitization equipment, at Hamilton Public Library here in Ontario, Vancouver Public Library, and then earlier this year we opened a new scanning center at Library and Archives Canada, which we're very excited about. Um, we also have um, data in a few different places in Canada, and also a new data center, which I'll show you a picture of in a minute. Um, um, and as I mentioned, there's many um, partners, not just doing digitization with us, but lots of um, organizations using, using Archive It and making use of the Community Webs project, which is a, a program of Archive It for smaller and uh, um, 
sort of more burgeoning uh, groups to use use archived services. So as I mentioned, we you know have been working uh, a little bit more in Western Canada, and one of those things is, is that we have a headquarters building um, that we get to go to uh, quite often in Vancouver, and it also looks like our logo, which is kind of fortuitous. Um, and it was it's a heritage building, which is perfect for us. Um, that was a former Bank of Canada building. So this is a space where we do conferences. Um, so if anyone in this group that needs to do a meeting or a conference in Vancouver, this is a space that we can uh, activate um, for ourselves and for our partners. And people get married there too. So that as a not-for-profit keeps, you know, keeps the wheels turning. Um, our data center is in also in um, British Columbia and is now in growth mode. Um, I probably have several emails uh, racking up about it right now. Um, and it's now um, uh, 10 racks of uh, servers and we're approaching about 50 petabytes of data and it's it's continuing to grow. And so this is the entire Canadian corpus of any anything that has been digitized or uploaded by a Canadian institution and also pieces of the international corpus as we sort of get the network of Internet Archive um, growing uh, across the world. Um, and as this, we sort of uh, get ready to pass on to the end here, just some numbers. This is just a snippet from our annual report last year. Um, uh, we digitized almost 40,000 items, 8 million pages were added to the collection. We worked with 42 contributing institutions, 32 sponsoring entities and libraries, and there are 50 web archiving partners in Canada. And we now have 27 um, folks dedicated to working for Internet Archive Canada. And really, of course, we can't do any of this work by ourselves. This is just uh, uh, a few of the organizations that we've worked with. Otherwise, it would be micro logos. Um, uh, and I just particularly like to thank the partners that host us in different places across Canada, um, because that really, as an, as fellow nonprofits, really makes, uh, you know, makes the world go round. Um, I'm just going to uh, finish before I pass off to Loren, just a quick overview of some of the other things that we are working on that if you're interested in, uh, we can send us a note, you can ask us a question about if we have time in the question period. Um, we have Democracy's Library, which is our government um, uh, um, compendium of uh, GovDocs that we're working on between the US and Canada. We are working with the National Library of Aruba to, um, you know, they digitize a lot of their material and we're having a, a, a server node on site. We're, of course, working in the decentralized web space. So there's some interesting things happening there. We're doing the end of term crawls really feverishly right now, especially in the United States, but also preparing for if we have a change in um, session in Canada. Um, there's some new improvements to search and discovery on archive.org. And I can't do a presentation without talking about AI. So we do have some AI projects and initiatives that are happening that if anyone's interested in, we can talk about. Um, but I will now pass it off to Loren to um, talk about our services and some other uh, things we have going on. So take it away, Loren. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Andrea. Okay, so um, next up, we're just going to focus on some services that we provide and is available for partner uh, organizations, starting off with uh, digitization. Uh, as Andrea mentioned, we have a number of digitization centers, uh, including some in Canada. We've developed our own uh, digitization equipment, both hardware and software, and we partner with many organizations, both large and small, uh, to digitize their collections. And just want to say that no set of items is too large or too small. So uh, sometimes we receive one book, sometimes it's a book truck, uh, a pallet, or even uh, shipping containers. So um, it, it really varies a lot. And sometimes uh, we even digitize digitize on site. Um, in these photos, uh, you can see uh, what we call our full frame scribe with scanners uh, digitizing uh, the collection of uh, government uh, documents. Um, our foundational partner, the University of Toronto, embarked on a major digitization project a couple of years ago, uh, which was completed um, this past April. And they digitized all of the government documents collection on the fifth floor of Robarts Library, which is 
um, the largest government publications collection. And it's resulted in over um, 50,000 new government publications being digitized, which is all now part of the uh, Canadian Government Publications Portal on archive.org. And uh, this past year, we also launched our project with Library and Archives Canada. So now we actually have six, six scribes working in Gatineau, Canada, uh, on uh, starting with Canadian and 19th century books um, at the moment. And in other places, uh, we have one scribe. So um, we have a number um, of scribes at some university locations, but this past, no, in 2023, we also expanded into public libraries, um, setting up scribes at Hamilton Public Library, and as uh, Andrew mentioned as well, Vancouver Public Library. And if you visit Vancouver Central Library, you can see the scribe in action as it's located out on the uh, open floor. So our full frame scribes um, are equipped with a floating V-shaped glass cradle, which is kind of spring loaded to create just enough pressure to spread the pages out when the glass is lowered onto two registration blocks. And it's also equipped with a couple of cameras uh, that offer variable uh, focal, focal distances. So we calibrate each item. So that makes them very adaptable for anything from paperbacks to dictionaries to city directories and so forth. Um, so we actually take photos, we actually we don't scan. Um, and I just wanted to provide a quick overview of some of the types of formats that we've digitized. So rare books, um, globally we've digitized more than um, 1.4 million 19th century books. This one here is the uh, Tempestu Tempestuous uh, Petticoat. Um, from the Thomas uh, Fisher Rare Books Library at University of Toronto. Um, and we have um, more than 400,000 books from our centers um, that were digitized that had been published between 1500 and 1800. Um, so lots of books. I, I kept the slide here because I really love this illustration, but also um, wanted to note that biodiversity is an area where um, many of our digitization partners have um, decided to, to digitize their, their collections and so what we've done, and as you know, with digital collections, you know, they, they can, they can, content can belong in, in many different types of collections. So uh, items with biodiversity content have been uh, digitally contributed to the Biodiversity Heritage Library. So which is now has over 260,000 uh, titles. Pamphlets, uh, pamphlets really a pro prolific mode of publishing for for centuries, so we've got, you know, we've really digitized uh, thousands, both bound as well as unbound. Um, postcards, so um, as we have more um, local history collections, more postcards coming online and digitizing. Uh, personal papers, um, so a lot of uh, archival font as well. Uh, manuscripts, um, so this one here is one of the manuscripts from, from the Royal Ontario Museum. And uh, publications, so many serial, like we've really done a lot. Um, and especially with uh, our focus now on government publications, like the U of T project, but also just with Democracies Library Canada, um, we're really dealing a lot with uh, publications and all the joys that serials bring. Uh, newspapers, which are like such a rich source of local history, right? They, they really document local responses to uh, provincial, national, and global affairs, and as well, um, you know, they're a really rich source of climate data when you think of all the weather reports uh, over the years. And maps as well, and for newspapers and, ma and maps and other large format um, items, we use a different type of scribe, a fold-out scribe, so it features a camera mounted over a flat surface with uh, images that are high resolution, but the process is uh, slower. Uh, microfilm is another, and we're getting uh, many more uh, microfilm uh, our way, uh, as many libraries are opting to digitize instead of replacing another microfilm reader. Microfiche, uh, this uh, type of donation has really grown. Um, you know, many universities in particular are reclaiming space and by getting rid of their microfiche cabinets. And um, when University of Toronto digitized all the GovDocs on the fifth floor, so um, most of the physical items were shipped to Downsby for storage, uh, but they did sort of deaccession some of the microfiche cabinets that contains, for example, UN uh, materials, and that's come over to us, and those that content will be digitized. 
Um, and another thing just I wanted to mention is that digitization is often a solution for fragile items. So broken bindings, flaky uh, pages, and other at-risk material. We really use a non-destructive process. Um, and we have a blog post about our uh, last chance scanning activities. And this one here was supposed to be, um, I don't know if you can see on screen, you can, great. Um, so just to sort of say that some of the last, like the last scanning is basically books that uh, once scanned will rarely be touched by humans again, but the content is still made accessible. And one of the things that we do is we try and match the um, original look as much as possible. So, you know, the coloring and, and that sort of thing. So that people feel like they're really um, reading the original, even though it's in a digital format. And um, not just many different formats, but also we work with um, digitized material that is uh, in a number of different languages. The other thing um, in terms of, um, so as I mentioned, we, we also have like um, software as part of um, our digitization equipment. And we assign every item a unique permanent ident identifier and attach bibliographic metadata. And once metadata is assigned, we begin to scan. And we also, this is also where we assert structural metadata like type, title and copyright pages. Uh, now, so that's the standard procedure, but sometimes we add bibliographic metadata later. So for example, with the U of T pro, uh, GovDocs project, as you know, many Gov publications don't um, have a catalog record. So some items were digitized, they're um, still up online, they were OCR, so they're full text searchable, but the metadata is um, being added. And in this case, we're experimenting with using AI to assist in capturing um, the title page and producing some of the basic metadata. So we're not starting from scratch. And in terms of metadata, we actually meet partners where they are. So sometimes it's spreadsheets, um, sometimes, uh, or sometimes it's even connecting to library catalogs. So really working with a variety of partners, it's really just um, every project is, is somewhat unique. And uh, once items are scanned, uh, we work with the organization and they're going to re they'll receive a report with direct links to all the digitized items. And just wanted to mention that in terms of the work we do, it's kind of like um, never, never done. Um, so, you know, uh, when material is digitized, we derive a number of files. Um, so most of the text items on archive.org have a number of different file formats uh, available. We provide partners with ongoing access to collections. So in terms of metadata and images, you can edit metadata, edit metadata as well. And it is, um, it could be temporary access as well. So for students, um, you know, when you have projects working on students, they can get access to, to do some of the things that you want them to do and then um, access is passed over. But you do have access uh, ongoing access to your to your collections, even though they've been uploaded already and made available on archive.org. Um, and uh, the other thing I wa really wanted to mention here is that um, as new technologies come into play, we will rederive items, and so we will reprocess uh, the digital files that we that we have. And in this example here, uh, you can see um, all of the files that have been derived and uh, that are available for viewing and downloading. And we really encourage partners that work with us to download a copy of their collections for local preservation. We offer documentation and support uh, to do so using the uh, IA command line tools. They're easy to use. We have a, and we have a developer portal uh, FAQ and we make the scripts available on GitHub as well. So the University of Alberta is a partner, one of our partners who uses our command tools, um, and they're currently using their site on archive.org as their institutional repository. So in this case, they've uploaded older projects. So um, the Peel Prairie Province's newspaper collections was, was uploaded and um, new files, um, so reprocessed, new files derived. And they also continue to digitize content at our Scribe Center, which is located at um, uh, one of the U of A uh, libraries. 
McGill University is another partner, so they digitize uh, themselves and then they upload the digitized content. Um, and just wanted to mention, it's not just uh, universities, uh, but also like local archives and other glam organizations. Um, you know, it's it's really sort of a feasible option for many because once uh, uh, items are uploaded to archive.org, they're OCR'd, files are derived, then those files can be downloaded and used on other repositories and platforms as well. And currently we're working on uploading a number of newspapers that were digitized as part of the Multicultural Canada Digitization Project. I think that took place um, like in the early 2000s, um, but they're moving off of the Simon Fraser University website because Simon Fraser is uh, re revamping their website. So we'll have about 20 um, multicultural newspapers from the Multicultural Historical Society of Ontario um, that will be made available via archive.org. And all of the work that we're doing, so we're currently at over uh, 901,000 texts as part of the Canadian uh, Libraries Collection on archive.org. So that's items that have been digitized in collaboration with Canadian partners or uploaded by Canadian GLAM organizations. Um, so I want to say that it's really truly a, the work that we do is really a collective uh, effort. And now I just wanted to highlight um, a few of the other services that are not digitization. Um, as Andrea mentioned, she archive it. Um, we currently have over 100 Canadian organizations and consortiums using archive it. And that's a, it's a subscription service for uh, web archiving curated web collections, which includes discovery, access and storage. And we do have two special programs. We have community webs, which is geared towards um, smaller uh, organizations, as well as um, CARTA, which is a collaborative art archive, all using Archive-It. And as I mentioned, we have both large and small Canadian partners. In this um, slide here, you see the BAMQ, but also the Community Archives of, uh, Arch uh, of Belva and Hastings, that is one of our community web partners. And um, this is interesting because what they're doing, so one of the things that they do is they web archive municipal election uh, websites. Um, so they're, they're taking that on on behalf of, of their community. We do, um, so Archive It also powers the web archiving work of Library and Archives Canada where uh, in this case we provide customized interfaces to uh, their web collections. Um, Vault. So Vault is a fairly new service uh, which was launched in 2023 and it's a digital repository and preservation services and I've put the link here and you can there's a, a additional information on Vault. We have Arch. So Arch is another uh, recent service, uh, another one that was launched in 2023. So it's really a research and education service. It helps users um, uh, easily build, access, and analyze, publish, and preserve web archive data sets at scale. And uh, this was made possible actually by a collaboration between um, the Archives Unleashed project. So this really has a Canadian stamp on it. So, uh, you know, folks from the University of Waterloo and, and New York. So just want to mention uh, Ian Milligan and Nick Ray. So they worked with our uh, web archiving and data services team in close collaboration. Um, we had a grant um, from the Mellon Foundation and uh, 2023, we took over the stewardship um, of offering this service to, um, to organizations. And um, although we are a digital library, but one of the things that uh, I don't think many folks know is that we also accept and store physical items, books, but also CDs, albums, microfilm, microfiche, uh, DVDs. So if you make a donation to Internet Archive, we actually keep, um, keep that. Um, so we have a very, it's a very robust donations program. We have a dedicated team that will help with um, the packing, the storing, the, the, and the transfer of materials. And we also have uh, deduplication tools as well. So you actually, you can go on your, on the app store and donate, a, there's a, sorry, and download a Donate Books app where you can scan a bar barcode to see if there's a copy already at IA. And we also have um, a new web tool that allows us to visualize 
what we've digitized from microfilm or print. So this is really helpful because it gathers data as well about title changes for, for a serial. It shows where we have gaps in our collection um, that our partners can help us fill in. So um, we have and continue to receive donations of all sizes in Canada. Our, lar our largest book donation to date was actually from Trent University in 2018. Um, that's where more than 200,000 um, books were donated um, to our physical collection. Uh, 172,000 were digitized uh, in a year. That was a really, uh, that was fast tracked. Um, and it's really a wonderful collection. It has many Canadian publishers um, and it has lots of content about uh, Canadian government and politics. Uh, yeah. So if you are deaccessioning some of your collections, get in touch with us um, or you can just go on our donations page. Uh, now I want to just flip it a little bit and just talk a little bit about services for patrons, uh, researchers, and the public. So um, I'm going to start off actually again with uh, archive.org. So that's our main platform for accessing the millions of items um, of various multimedia formats. Um, we have, we will literally have millions of users every day that, that access that platform. And um, it's not just uh, text. I mean, um, you know, we tend to focus on the text, but it's not just text. Uh, for example, we have oral histories. Um, this one here in particular is um, more than 24,000 uh, oral histories, both in audio and video from Densho, which is a group that documents the Japanese American experience of internment during the Second World War. We also have uh, over 1.4 million uh, podcast episodes that have been pre uh, preserved. So many uh, creators of podcasts use archive.org for preservation. Um, you know, the podcast sort of platform, some of them are just a little bit ephemeral. Um, you know, sometimes episodes stay available for a season or a year and then they're gone. So we consider this collection a preservation project. Um, archiving space is where many people share ideas, news, uh, fun, and conversation of the present day. I think it's a real snapshot of the, you know, concerns and issues um, that are going on. And this one, I also wanted to highlight, I think this is a really cool project, uh, fairly new as well in the last couple of years. And that's DLARC, which is the digital library of amateur radio. So ham radio, uh, you know, if people still remember what it was, sure we're listening, college radio. So this is what um, uh, this particular uh, initiative or project is, is archiving, reaching out and uh, finding uh, materials and uh, getting them digitized and up available on archive.org. So um, we do provide lots of features and functionalities for end users, including accessible formats. So with um, with textbooks, there's the read aloud option and a DAISY text file for the print disabled. But we also do bigger projects. So for since 2011, we've been digitizing uh, modern 20th century books and making them available through con uh, controlled digital lending uh, for users with print dis disabilities via the ACE portal. So the ACE portal or the Accessible Content e portal is a service of OCL slash scholars portal. We provide the on-demand uh, digitization. Scholars portal sources the material and controls the access for students with accessibility needs at the 21 universities in Ontario. So um, I am actually not sure if there's a similar service for the Atlantic provinces, uh, but maybe someone can let me know. And if there isn't, we're open to talking about possibilities because one of the things as well that we're uh, looking to focus on is, is doing more uh, of the accessibility work. Uh, IA Scholar. So this is actually like a wonderful resource. I told my kids, both students. Um, so this is a full text search index that includes over 40 million research articles and other scholarly papers. Um, it really runs the gamut from, you know, digitized um, copies of 18th century, century journals through the lotus, latest open access conference proceedings. Um, you know, content from natural resources, uh, humanities, uh, biomedicine, art, history, 
um, you know, industrial research, government reports, and more. And uh, it also has um, a citation link. So, you know, you click on it and it gives you the different formats to cite the work, a permalink, um, links to metadata in FATCAD as well, and where you can access it um, online. Uh, interlibrary loan. Um, so this is um, uh, a service. Again, I believe Andrea mentioned that we, we, you know, at a peak, we get 500 requests per day. It's a service for the individual uh, patron or researcher. So one can request a chapter or article with a, with a free um, IA account. But it's also a service for libraries who are part of a consortium such as, you know, the Boston Library Consortium, Rapid IL. Uh, you can find a lot more details um, at the URL here, but just I want to sort of put a shout out and sort of say, please consider participating uh, in this service. This is one of the services that we're uh, hoping to go in uh, 2025. The Wayback Machine, I know Andrea mentioned, um, you know, it really is an incredible service, uh, heavily used by journalists and researchers. And uh, just wanted to mention that. Um, Although sort of sort of we do the work in terms of going out there and, and crawling the World Wide Web, you know, anyone can capture a web page, right? So we have the Save a Page tool. So this is something that you can let your patrons uh, know about. And um, I've shown you many examples of collections from library and archive partners that are tagged as part of the Canadian Libraries collection. But um, I wanted to close by noting that archive.org is also used as a platform for preserving and making local collections accessible. For example, here it's uh, radio programs that were uploaded by CKRL, which is the oldest French language community radio station in Canada. So as you work with local organization and partners, we encourage you to remember that Internet Archive and Internet Archive Canada is also an option for uh, community organizations. And uh, now uh, we can turn to questions. Um, I just want to say thank you for your time um, and that we welcome new partners. But for now, we'll uh, give it over to any questions because we still have some time. That's great. Well, great. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Andrea. Uh, Lauren, I, I really had no idea that the Internet Archive had so many, so many <laughs> projects and initiatives ongoing, and um, it's pretty amazing. Um, but I'll let uh, the audience ask questions. Um, if you want to drop in the chat, or you could just unmute yourself and ask. Um, we have a, a comment by David that. Um, uh, he looks forward to learning more about textual transcription projects and audio transcription work that that's done by the Internet Archive. Um, maybe that's something a little bit uh, you can talk a little bit more about. But um, um, yeah, I think we um, we're still in a little bit of an experimental phase, but I, I guess that's probably true for everyone doing AI projects. Um, uh, so we are making use of the Whisper um, AI. Um, I guess that's an that is an LLM of, uh, and a service. So what we're using that for in kind of like targeted ways is doing transcriptions of music to pull the lyrics from certain songs. Um, I wish I had my my link handy. The the example I did a test on was we have this great bowling LP from like 1961 of like how to improve your bowling. Um, so it, just running it on things like that, you know, that's a, sort of a fun example. But uh, on a more real example, uh, Loren mentioned the oral histories. That's one one um, uh, subject area where that, that, that text transcription really has a lot of potential. Um, when we have hundreds and sometimes thousands of videos um you know that we can we can pull the the text transcripts which then allows sort of full text searching and um uh search and discovery and that sort of thing and the other thing that we're doing as well it's um experimenting with with other languages so the aruba project 
So their language is really interesting. It's like uh, mostly spoken by the by three the um, the three uh, Aruba, Bonaire, and Curaçao. I'm learning a lot, but it's um, Papiamento. And so um, they used uh, Transcribus, and then we've we've uploaded to um, uh, you know to archive.org. So we are exper experimenting on that level as well. And uh, I'm going to note this, and I'm going to add in an extra slide uh, for the next time we, we give this talk to uh, to talk about that. But yeah, absolutely, transcription is um, like both text and audio is is one of part of the work that we're doing. Okay, great. Uh, Darren Frazier is asking, how does the how does the IA deal with issues regarding copyright and ownership? Uh, as a pretty frequent IA user, I found that most documents can do be downloaded with no restrictions. Copyright. That's if you Google the Internet Archive, you'll you'll see some things about copyright. Um, so how will I answer this? Um, I think the terms of service of the Internet Archive, like in terms of uh, the things that outside people add to the archive, um, folks do need to ha either be a rights holder or something needs to be in the public domain to, you know, add it to the Internet Archive. And it's, um, we do have a fairly robust takedown policy workflow so that, you know, there are times when people upload things that do not pass the sort of copyright test and you know we do we do we do have to take some things down from the public collections and then in terms of how we work with other partners um the sort of due diligence to determine whether you have the rights to put something out and make it fully accessible or is we do that in partnership with whoever we're working with um, so there is a lot of public domain material, and I will say in the Canadian collection, it's almost all public domain material and what has been, you know, worked on in all these projects all, all of these years. But we do have the modern books collection that we have had litigation surrounding in the United States, and we're kind of in uh, the process of um, making some decisions about how that material is available to the general public how it's available to people for accessibility you know all of all of those kinds of things but um we are no matter what preserving that material for the long term right so for the next 50 years plus um we're making that distinction between preservation and access is what i would say and also it's uh, again you know with library and archives partners like they hold the materials and they know um, what the rights are associated with their collections so um um, and the other thing as well is um, with metadata, you know, there is um, rights fields that uh, are made available. And again, um, you know, that we can um, transfer from the bibliographic uh, metadata uh, that the partner provides. Uh, one interesting thing I just want to mention is like Crown copyright. So the U of T GovDocs digitization project. So the decision there was to make um, everything there uh, open. So all of all of that content uh, available and um, uh, and that was a decision to sort of say, you know, uh, crown copyright, uh, you know, we should make this th this uh, available. Um, as uh, Andrea mentioned, we do have a takedown service, so it's written in, in that collection that, that if anybody has issues. Um, but um, this is a plug for the work that uh, CFLA and Carl did, uh, best practices uh, in terms of um, uh, collections, you know, crown copyright. Right, so you can you can Google it. Um, I mean, it's up on the Carl website, and um, like the four case studies there, where they uh, was what, either web archiving or digitization activities dealt with uh, IA partners. Um, and uh, but it's it's um, you know sometimes it's it's pushing with the idea of of, of um, and the changing um, uh, ideas around copyright. Okay. Um, any other questions right now? So I'll use moderator's privilege to answer my own question. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure one you might be expecting about uh, recent uh, development. Um, mm -hmm. So last month's um, breach uh, by hackers, just wondering how it's, how it's affected your your day-to-day, -day, your 
workflow just you know just what a what kind of impact has this had on your your work in the last month yeah i think i was actually just thinking about this yesterday because so it's been about five weeks oh. it's been a wild five weeks <laughs> but i think one and for any of the other libraries that have been through something like this there's the actual technical cyber incident and then there's like the human cost of the ongoing cost of of something like this that you know the internet moves on but our, our our you know our people are tired like you know making a comeback from this so um for though i guess if i can just give a brief overview you know we had the 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 indications that we've had we had some you know insurgents let's say and we did the immediate mitigation when when those things were discovered and then we made the decision to really batten down the hatches and really spend the last month going through every line of code, um, you know, checking absolutely every service, you know, fast tracking our security plan that, you know, the next, the last, you know, what we were going to do in the next three years we did in the last, in this last month. Um, so it's definitely um, changed our perception of how we work. Um, we, the Internet Archive really had this very open, well, we still have a very open philosophy, but it's sort of upended it to where we we added many more layers of, um, it's a, a sort of complex Venn diagram now, um, but most of the services are back now. Um, some of the, our partner services have had some changes that we're, we're just, you know, we're finalizing so i'd say we're almost all the way back but it's been uh it's been quite a tough recovery and you know i think it has changed it's changed quite a few things about our outlook for the next phase um so yes i mean i'm just going to sort of say that so we were we were lucky that the that nothing happened in terms of the data um, so that was secure. We have um, a copy uh, of our Canadian data just here in our Canadian um, uh, data center. So we're really pleased about that. Um, and, but yeah, it's it's um, uh, you know it's just really made us um, think about a lot about in terms of like who has access to what. And uh, you know we've been we've always been a very open culture, and so now it's it's you know we've we've got layers, but. Um, yeah, none of the data was was breached or touched in any way. So, and we have we have a really we have a really great team of uh, of you know engineers and 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 secure and people who work on uh, security issues. So, yeah. And I, just one more sort of selfishly Canadian thing uh, regarding the Canadian data center because it's our newest data center. The architecture is different, and 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 so that was an additional layer of protection against, you know, what what we were we were dealing with. So the US data and the international data was, you know, we've we've uh, tested it every which way and the, the data was not touched. But the Canadian corpus had a new, another layer, which was sort of like validating for our work the last few years, like before this happened, mm -hmm. that it's another reason why having that uh, the Canadian center is important okay thanks um we have enough time for another question if anyone has one so i mean i'll put a plug in here just to sort of say that our emails are very easy so it's loren at archive.org so l-o-r-e-n at archive.org or andrea at archive.org so if you think of any questions um, after this is over or um, if you're interested in any of the services, um, you know, please feel free to to contact us. Um, if you're interested in donations, we have a donations form. If you're interested in any digitization project, we have a, an inquiry form. But again, you can just uh, shoot us an email. All right. Well, there's nothing else. I'm going to thank you. <laughs> Lauren and uh, Andrea.
And um, this has been this has been great. Like I said, I'm amazed at the amount of initiatives you <laughs> you guys have going sim simultaneously. It's just, uh, yeah, we're <laughs> really a lot. <laughs> I've been here two years, and I'm still learning about. I'm still learning so much. Oh, I bet. I bet. So. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank and, you for uh, us. Yeah, and and oh, for no listening. Problem. So, thank you. Great. Thank you.